Hello and welcome back to Football Aranya. It's podcast 37 and I, Michael Statham, am joined by Michael Bell and James Rowe to talk all Dutch football. On the menu today, we talk about the Netherlands' 2-1 defeat to France, the start of the new Eredivisie season and a look ahead to PSV and Ajax's Champions League campaigns. We are available on YouTube, SoundCloud and iTunes. Make sure to subscribe to our platforms if you're new and give us a big thumbs up if you enjoy listening today. Your support means a lot to us and it's fantastic to see we're, get, we're getting well over a thousand listeners to our podcast every week. Thank you. All right, fellas, um, let's start by talking about France against the Netherlands. France won 2-1. Uh, the world champions had the best chances, perhaps. But um, overall, even though it was defeat, was this a po- more positive or were there still some more, more negatives to do with this performance? Going into the France game, I think, you look at the Netherlands as being heavy underdogs and you didn't really expect them to get anything out of the game. But the performance was encouraging to an extent, um, but there are still some big errors that need to be cut out. You saw it against Peru in the first game as well, that they seemed to go into the game and not get started until maybe the second half. It was the same against the first game against Peru. They were awful in the first half. could have been 3-0 down um, in the early stages. Then against France, when you think that Koeman would have got them going and saying that, you know, these are world champions, let's get at them and um, let's show that what we can do. And then, you know, Quincy promised me such a, a basic error with that back header um, to concede that goal. And, you know, in the second half, everyone's improved. They got the goal and um, they could have taken the lead. Uh, Memphis strike went into the side netting. And then, you know, it's just another sucker punch it. At the end, I think, I said it in a tweet at the time, um, or in an article that I did, that sometimes some players don't play as well for the Netherlands as they do for the clubs. And I think um, they've made Virgil van Dijk the captain, but so far for Netherlands, has he been as good as he is for Liverpool? I'd say no. Um, would he, in a Liverpool shirt, get beat to that ball by Olivier Giroud? Probably not. It's like a, a lack of concentration at a big time, and it's costing Netherlands in these games. It's cost them during the Euros, the World Cup qualifying. Uh, it's just something mentality-wise isn't right at the moment. It was, it was always going to be tough to go away to the newly crowned world, uh, newly crowned world champions and uh, and get a positive result. But if you look a year before when, uh, when they were hammered in Paris 4-0 and to only get beat, in this case 2-1, uh, you know, there are signs of life, but it just goes to show how much of a job is on for Koeman and how uh, extensive the rebuilding work is. You know, and it, it, with the well-documented uh, failures to qualify for the World Cup and the Euros, you know, the, the how messy it was behind the scenes hasn't helped. And it was always going to be a long road um, back. I was at the Peru game and the physicality of Peru in the f- opening 15 to 20 minutes, they c- couldn't live with them. And it was also a little bit of ignorance to think that this was this is more of a, a farewell game for Snyder than actually an opportunity to to play against a team with a different different culture and a different style of play. It done well to get the win in the end, um, and with the, uh, the obviously the assist from uh, De Jong as well. And there's there's signs of life with the selection as well, but it's just going to take a long time. But um, yeah, there's a long way to go as well. I think hopefully with every international setup, there'll be uh, every international break, there'll be uh, there'll be slight improvement. But this this was never going to be a quick fix, and um, there are signs of life here and there in terms of player selection, in terms of building a, a more cohesive unit. But it will still take a long time. Having heard both of your opinions, there, I, I'm more leaning towards James's side of that. You know, you've got to look at how far they've come from that four 0 defeat to France. You know, not so long ago, and to only lose two one, and they almost got a result, and I think they deserved it actually in the end. It was. It, Perhaps a bit controversial to say that, but I think they deserve the point out of that performance. Um, but but Mike, do you not see that the the the, the big the huge positives out of this performance and that the likes of Frankie De Jong coming on and showing that he has such huge potential in this team? Oh yeah, I'm, I was optimistic about the future after that result. I just think that you know Kimmin needs to get a few things sorted out, and I don't want to be totally like happy with a defeat. There has to be something that needs to change and I think if you look at both games the first 45 minutes in both wasn't good enough and um, that's what Kevin needs to look at 
next few games. Frankie de Jong is, was excellent. He's, for me, the future uh, Dutch midfield. He's the one that's going to take over the mantle and make it tick for the years to come. Um, for me, he needs to start if he's fit from now on. Um, but then you look at another, like another few of the selections that he made. And de Jong, yes, that was a great decision. But then you got to look at other ones like why was Kenny Tete playing right back when he's not even played a single match where well, he might have come on for like a minute or two for Leon this season when you've got Daryl Yanmat on the bench. Daily Bund as well um, had two difficult games. Ryan Babo is pretty anonymous. I know he scored the goal. That takes away from an anonymous performance. I think if you've got to pick up positive, you say Matthijs De Ligt, uh, Ginny Wijnaldum had an excellent game against France and I think up front you got Memphis Depay as well who looks excellent and he's going to be the focal point for that attack going forward but I think over the next few months I think Kimmel needs to look at some fresh players for certain positions I think if you're looking at left winger and the full back positions they need to change um, drastically you got Rick Carsdorp coming back into the fold at, at Roma I'd rather see him playing right back in the future and then you got to look at options for the attack. You know, Dan, Dan Juma Grunewald is doing excellent work for uh, Club Bruges in Belgium. He comes into it, maybe even giving Justin Cliver a chance. I saw him, he came off the bench for Roma. I know they drew 2-2 today, but he, um, he was very lively. I think these players need a chance because he's done so well at picking Frankie de Jong and looking at some younger players. And I think he needs to focus on these younger players going forward um, because they're bringing some fresh some fresh ideas to the national team and it's, and it's working to an extent, an extent but he needs to get rid of the ones that aren't performing like Kenny Tete and Kevin Strickman who was awful against Peru again. Uh, yeah, Kenny Tete playing right wing back was an interesting selection by Koeman given that he said uh, Tete was in the squad because he's a more defensive right back but actually he, his best moments in the game against France came in an attacking sense. You know, he set up the equalising goal with a cross on the right wing um, but it's just it's just really odd how how Koeman's got this formation with five at the back, fine, but Tater playing right wing back, who's quite defensive, but also Barber on left wing back, who's quite attacking. There's there's a lack of balance there. I think in the end it shifts to more of a back four with Blint as, at sort of like a left back. Uh, but it's just uh, an odd way of 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 uh, setting the team up. And but Michael, it is interesting what you say about that the, there's still many things that we can't be that pleased about with the Dutch national team and. Ronald Koeman wasn't very happy as well, was he, in his post-match uh, interview? Because he was saying things like uh, that the France's winning goal had nothing to do with the quality and that actually it should have been stopped. And as you said, Van Dijk is, was, is the one then to blame for the fact that Giroud got in front of him. Um, so it's, it's good also to hear that Koeman's not happy because he knows that there's still a, lot, a long way to go and there's still potential in this team to do even better, which is a far cry from what we had before. I think definitely. I think you've got to look at the game against Germany is going to be targeting a win. Um, you know, the German national team is probably the lowest it's been in a few years. And I think Koeman will he'll look at those errors, he'll look at the team selections and he'll do something definitely in October. I'm sure of that. Another important thing to remember is that when Koeman signed his deal, uh, it, his current deal runs until uh, 2022. And he's adamant that he's going to see it out at all costs. He doesn't appear to be distracted at club level, doesn't want to leave. He's wanting to uh, to see it out at all costs. And I think uh, I think it's just a long old road. And I think he would help himself uh, to to dip into potential uh, young Oranya candidates and have a more of a, a transparent link between the two. Obviously, uh, Frankie de Jong. A, a tremendous uh, decision, but there's there's quality in the under 21s. You know, if you look at uh, Dumfries as well, we've come up through the, tradi the traditional route uh, of Sparta, Rotterdam, Heel and Rain, and now PSV. I think he'll go on to have a very good season uh, with his physicality and his intelligence. He could uh, he could do a job for the national team going forward. So I think Kuma would be wise to um, to work with the under 21s as well and and cast a net wide. You know, you've got many. You've got Nations League games. You've got uh, friendly games coming up. You know, cast for net wide, uh, experiment to the best of your ability. Because it's, you've got you've got Nation League promotion and relegation now. And if you're realistic, you're looking at the Netherlands being relegated from the Group A, if you like. 
and then uh, because being in the group with the uh, two former world champions and uh, well, the current the current world champions and the, and the former world champions too so they're going to drop down and only then will you start to see you have to take two steps back in order to, uh, to go a couple of steps forward so I think uh, he'd be wise to experiment cast the net wide uh, have different players coming in from different times and try to brick by brick build a team that can compete because that's the the whole objective that he was uh, that he was appointed for James just mentioned about uh, the amount of young players that should be introduced to the team Cummins always looking at that kind of thing isn't he and his assistant case on Vondelen is the under 17s manager but Abdul asks a question on Twitter saying why does Cummins insist on daily blint so if he's so keen on youth why aren't players like blint being passed aside yet um I personally think I think because it, at the moment it, it feels it feels a gap. I mean, you got to remember as well he's only been in charge since since February. You know, it's, uh, we're, I know it's uh, you know um, it's not a short amount of time, but it's it, due to the the problems behind the scenes as we well documented on previous pods and the failure to qualify for tournaments. It it can't be underestimated what a mess was left was left behind. And this can't be um, this can't be underestimated. And as well, when you we go back into the best ducks teams in the past and the characters involved, these characters were pure winners. These characters were 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 players that wanted to win at all costs, but had a real a real wi winning mentality. And the characters change as as, as different generations change. And Kuman is now confronted with with building a team. And um, you know it's going to it's going to take time, but he would help as I, as I said previously, he would help himself to uh, to cast the net as wide as possible and experiment. You know, experiment in terms of players playing in different countries, in terms of uh, uh, youth players in the Netherlands itself, and and give them a path to come through, and 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 play and play with freedom because it's very important going forward. On Dilly Blind. Um... I think Kimmins said that he wanted him in there because of his passing ability. Um, but then you got to look at it against France where they looked to De Ligt and Frankie de Jong, I think they, the two of them had the most possession out of any of the Netherlands players and their passing quality is, is a huge asset for Ajax as well. So you got to wonder why Kimmin decides that De Ligt's worthwhile in the centre defence when he's also got somebody like Nathan Ake who has been excellent for Bournemouth so far this season. Then you've got Stefan de Vrij as well. You've got Timothy Foles and Menz. All these players that could come in and do a better defensive job than Daley Blind. Why have him just in for his passing ability when he's also a liability from crosses? You saw that against Peru. He got beaten easily. There's a few shaky moments against France as well. I think um, you've got to hope that Cummins seen that and will try and edge him out. I think he's, he's an experienced player and he's one of the you know, the bigger names of Dutch football right now, but I think Mike's Kevin Strootman, he's been quite strict with him. I think he needs to bench the Lubin for the next game. Interesting opinions. Um, and we look forward to talking more about the Netherlands as we head into uh, a month's time they're playing again in the Nations League against Germany. Um, now, fellas, we need to talk about the area de busy. We're five games in now, um, and the table's starting to take a little bit of shape. Uh, at the top, we've got PSV, Ajax and Feyenoord sitting at the top three. Um, but I want to talk about the newly promoted sides. Um, FC Emmen are currently sitting in, in 8th, Fortuna Sittard in 11th and De Graafstaart in 15th. I want to get your opinion on um, who do you think has been the best out of those three teams so far? Who's made the best start? I think FC Emmen. I think for their debut season at the highest level in this country, uh, they've done ever so well. But with uh, Dick Lukin in charge, it doesn't surprise me. As you know, I uh, interviewed Timo Letschert, um, who uh, now plays for Utrecht, but was uh, then a player of uh, Sassuolo. And we spoke about uh, Dick Lukin, and he told me that it was Dick Lukin that convinced him that he could play as a defender. And I asked him about his qualities of, uh, of Dick Lukin, and he said his man management is second to none in terms of building a cohesive unit where players will believe and do the job that's set out uh, and the job they've been asked to do. If you look today to win um, to win away at Utrecht, it's, it's no mean feat. I know that Utrecht are not in form, they're not doing well, but to, to come up to the Eredivisie for the very first time on a limited budget 
and to win a, a, a fairly well-known difficult away game is um, is very um, is very impressive. I think with Fortuna Sittard, they're not afraid. Um, they want to give everything they've got, and they're doing that. And um, it just goes to show that the gap between the Europa League and uh, the Eredivisie is not uh, the the bottom half of the Eredivisie, if you like. It's, it's not very it's not very big at all. I've spoken to to many managers who've often said that to me. Molly Stein, in particular, who told me that he didn't believe the gap between the um, the top of the Europa League and uh, and the bottom half of the Eredivisie uh, was very big. And uh, and finally, with Henk de Jong at the Graaf Club, when I spoke to him uh, before the season started. He told me that it was important for the, for them to to entertain the home fans, not just to to make up the numbers in their early visit, but to entertain the home fans and and to give a good account of themselves. And they went on to beat uh, to beat Feyenoord in, at home, and that was an impressive statement. And I think all three clubs are doing themselves uh, a, a good service by the the way they've put themselves about so far. It's a long old season, as we know. You know, many a twist and turn ahead. But I think it's very, it's very refreshing as well. We are, we report on this league. We, uh, we speak to professional people in this league. We, uh, all three of us, have an awful lot, of, an awful lot of knowledge about it. But we all know that it's an acquired taste, and anything can happen. It's not just about the traditional top three in in in, in, in the way that lots of people think. For me, I think um, Emin have had a little bit of luck. Certainly, they're on seven points, but then you'll get the teams that have beat a uh, terrible Arald and Hag side. Um, yeah, they won at Utrecht today, but uh, Utrecht went down to 10 men. Um, for me, the best out of the lot so far has been Fortuna Sittard. I think um, they showed some fight against PSV. They just narrowly lost 2-1 to them. Uh, they won away at NEC Breda. It's their first win of the season so far, but they've also held Utrecht as well. I think they've got some really nice attacking players. Um, uh, Semedo and Novakovic up front, two good attacking players. And are, um, also meant to be getting uh, the ex PSV winger uh, Zuzak, the Hungarian, who will be a very good signing for them if he does eventually come in. And I can see them staying up. I think uh, the Graf's Cup have had a difficult start to the season after they, they beat Feyenoord in the opening game of the season, which was an excellent result, but since then they've been sort of off the ball. But I think all three have shown that. The, I don't know if it's the quality reasons or just that there's a few teams in the air division who are quite poor this season and I think um, the battle at the bottom is going to go between maybe maybe even seven or eight teams. I think there's quite a few in the air division this season that are very poor. I think you can add NSA to that, you can add Groningen to that, you can add Excelsior. Um, here in Wien have had a, a shocker to start the season as well, I think. There's a number of teams that could get dragged into the bottom, and I think um, it's going to be tight this year. Agreed. Um, Mike, I think for Tunis uh for one, they are the best most team that have come up. Um, I think we saw that in how they played against PSV, where they were really close and they only lost 2-1. Um, and it's only going to improve where they've got Novakovic and Semedo that are still yet to really get their form going. They had a decent start, but I'm waiting for them to... Hit, hit a bit more form um, and yeah Palas Zizak coming in former PSV winger like what a sign that would be um, for Fortuna uh, yeah and to Kafs up as well uh, interesting comments from manager Hank de Jong I think what, what, once he gets a little bit flustered he starts to getting a little bit irritated in interviews I noticed that when he was at Combo in the past um, and it's the same now into the Kafs up he didn't like the way his team played against VVV when they lost 2-1 and start criticising his team as being uh, a team that belongs in the second division and not in the area of uh with the way they played. Um, and, and hopefully that doesn't continue, otherwise it could be a long, hard season for them. But it could be a long, hard season for a lot of teams, like you say, Mike. Um, Honingen, Nak, uh, Peck Zwolle haven't had a good start either. Um, and they're the, the bottom three at the moment as well. I think Ardo is shipping too many goals. Um, and, and you've always got the likes of Excelsior and VVV that could get dragged into it just purely because of resources. But yeah, no, a lot of teams are having slow starts. Um, and I, I, I think it is a quality thing, Mike. I think it's um, a, a, a small decrease in quality yet again in the league. I think the top of the league's got stronger, but I think at the bottom of the league, a lot of teams have taken for granted that they may not be involved in the bottom three and are happy to finish mid-table. Um, and I think that we've seen that again this summer with some of the the spending or more lack of it from 
certain clubs. I take your point on Hank de Jong, uh, Michael, but having spoke to him before the season started, he's extremely passionate. And I've, I just think that, um, I think the class are going to be okay. Uh, I think I went on record before the season started as saying, I think all three promoted teams will stay up. And I, uh, I stand by that. Yeah, it, it could well happen that we have all three stay up. I wouldn't be surprised by that either, to be honest. Uh, one, one of the teams that has stood out for me so far this season is Vitesse. I don't know if you, you two both agree with that. Um, I think Leonard Slutsky's made a, a fantastic start to life in the Netherlands. Um, he, he really just gets into the nitty-gritty of, of how his team play and just understands his players very well. And he's getting the best out of his forwards, Brian Linson and, and Tim Matus. I, I, I really hope, we, we, spoke, we spoke about the national team earlier in this pod, I really hope Linson is, is capped at some point in this season. Even if it's just a friendly, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, together with Matavs and, uh, and Slutsky, when he arrived in this country, he said that you know, this is a great springboard for him to start his uh, career in Europe. And he wants to, um, he was attracted to the league by the, by the history, by the, the footballing culture. And I think he's just hell bent on doing really well, and it's no surprise because he's he's got something about him. You know, he's a um, he's managed the the Russian national team, he managed the CSKA in Moscow in the Champions League, so he's, he's certainly not a bad manager. And I think uh, uh, it's no surprise to me to see him doing very, very well. Have any other teams stood out for you so far this season, Eredivisie? I think you got to look at um, Heracles, who have had a very good start this season. Are currently sitting fourth. Um, you no, know, they beat Herenveen 5-3 on Sunday. Uh, Christopher Peterson has had an excellent start to the season. He got another couple of goals today. Their front line is just um, it's very strong, I think, for one of these teams that you know might be around mid-table. I think they've got the best attacking options out of all the mid-table teams. You've got Kuas, who didn't even play today. They had Peterson and Dalmau up front. Then you had Van der Water come in. Uh, I think uh, all of very strong options for... And they've got loads of goals in them. I think they could be a, a top half team this season. I think they've done very well so far. Um, apart from stating the obvious, I think PSV have stood out for me so far. Um, I raised the question uh, Van Bommel making this step up from under 19s to, uh, to manage the first team of PSV. And the most impressive thing for me is not necessarily how they're putting teams away and how many goals they're scoring. When you listen to Van Bommel address the Dutch media and what he's saying, you've, he has so much belief regarding his, his selection and regarding his ability and what he's actually uh, tr uh, trying to achieve that when you listen to him, you realise, hang on a minute, this is, just a, this is a man that's played at the highest level, that's won at the highest level and is hell-bent on success in his own right as a manager. I, I, read, a, um, I read a Dutch uh, football article from a, a journalist based here stating that Van Bommel has, uh, has the qualities to go on to become the best uh, Dutch um, team manager since... Uh, Dutch football manager since Van Gaal. And uh, although it still may be a bit premature, I know that on the eve of the season I was a little bit wary of Van Bommel's ability, but he, the way he's talking and the way his, his teams are putting uh, putting teams away, you know, a 7 0 win yesterday in in, uh, in The Hague. I mean, Ardo is not, yes, they're in a bit of a disarray at the moment. It's not the easiest away game to play. Uh, PSV have dropped many a points there through the years and they've just absolutely dismantled them. And uh, it would be very interesting to see how PSV get on in the Champions League this season and Ajax for that matter too. Yeah, let's talk about um, how, how we think PSV might get on in the Champions League. They've arguably been handed probably the group of death. Uh, they've with Barcelona, Spurs and Inter Milan. Um, is there any hope of them qualifying? And, you know, they're playing Barcelona away in their first match uh, coming up. So, what, what do we think about Van Bommel's uh, tactics there? Because, of course, they've had a fantastic start to life in the area of Vizier, but are the attacking tactics going to be used again? Is that, is that a brave way of doing it, perhaps? I think it's going to be his first real test um, of the season. I think he's done excellently. So far, even in pre-season, I said going into the season, I had PSV as my favourites to win a title again. I thought he was doing excellent stuff with them, um, even before the season started. And with the way he was talking about how the campaign was going to go. He's got such a physical way of playing um, in the midfield and the three up front are capable of scoring at any moment. I think 
in the air division, they're going to basically wipe teams away. But then when it comes to Champions League, it's going to be interesting to see how he adapts. I think in recent years, you've seen, you know, Philip Koku change his formation a couple of years ago in the Champions League to go five defenders. And I hope Van Bommel doesn't do that because I want to see how this team does um, against the likes of Tottenham and Inter Milan. I think maybe Barcelona's maybe a step too far. Um, but you've got to look at Tottenham and Inter Milan, the way they've started the season. They've not started the season great. Inter lost at home to Parma at the weekend and I think Tottenham lost at home to, to Liverpool I think PSV definitely have a chance against these teams if they they should be targeting home wins against them if they can win both home games they could probably nix in away um, but Barcelona you know that's a totally different kettle of fish and it's uh, it's going to be difficult um, and I think maybe PSV might just have to take their first loss on the chin this week and uh, I hope it doesn't make Van Bommel change anything going forward I think Van Bommel was smart enough to realise the differences between the Eredivisie and the Champions League. Um, I give PSV a chance of um, of uh, maintaining European football this season. I think that Inter and Spurs in particular will underestimate PSV Eindhoven, especially away from home. And um, you know, PSV uh, in the past uh, entertained Tottenham, and uh, I think they knocked them out of the uh, I think they knocked them out of the UEFA Cup. I think that might have been about a decade ago, but still, it's uh, something they managed to do. Um, I think that PSV have a ch- have a chance to at least qualify for um, for the Europa League. I'm not entirely convinced by um, by Inter. They lost, uh, as Mike said, uh, they lost to Parma uh, yesterday. Even though a lot of money has been invested, uh, Tottenham playing at home Wembley isn't really their home, is it? So I wonder how much home advantage they're actually going to have and, and, and Monaco went to um, to Wembley and tore Spurs apart I think it was last season so you see that um, or the season before perhaps sorry and so you see that um, there are opportunities there I um, I think that PSV will at the very least maintain European football going into uh, going into the winter and I think that they'll surprise a few teams especially at home yeah, I, I'm in agreement with both of you two as well. I hope we're, all three of us are right on this, that they have a really good chance of finishing third, at, at least. Um, they should get some results. Of course, Barcelona's a step too far. My concern in the Champions League for PSV is that, uh, I think we've spoken about this before on the podcast, but especially in the Champions League, that the defence is going to get found out. It's, it's a good back four, but is it, is it fast enough and clever enough to keep out Barcelona, to keep out Spurs and Inter Milan? I'm worried that Verhaven and Schwab together, they're, they're very good, but they have to be playing very deep to have a chance of, of keeping out some of the, the pacier strikers and wingers that Europe has to offer. Um, so, yeah, I, I personally think that PSV will, will face a tough battle, but they have a good chance. Um, how, how about Ajax then um, as a final topic this week? They, they, they also are in the Champions League and face arguably an easier group. Uh, Bayern Munich have a top seed. But AEK Athens and Benfica are their opposition. Um, how confident are both of you that Ajax can finish second in that group? I'm very confident, but it all really depends on Wednesday's game. I think Wednesday's game is so crucial uh, for Ajax. If they can get off that winning start against AEK Athens, then that sets the tempo for the rest of the, the group. I think on their day, they're, they're better than AEK Athens and they... I mean, they're say they're probably better than Benfica at the moment. Um, I think they've got an excellent side, excellent young side with so much talent that, you know, at home against Bayern Munich, who says they can't go toe to toe with them? Um, I think they have a great chance of finishing second for me. For me, the key game in this group is the game in Lisbon. Uh, I think if Ajax can uh, can keep Benfica. Uh, at arm's length in Lisbon and get a positive result, I think they'll go through second. Um, uh, the away games in Lisbon and Athens are going to be the, the keys. I'm confident with with Ajax at home. They uh, the whole um, the whole of Amsterdam will be behind them. The the, t- the tickets for the Champions League matches sold out in the blink of an eye to season ticket holders within 24 hours. You know the the, the passion that everybody's you know they're looking forward to a first Champions League campaign in four years. Uh, everybody's um, everybody's ready. Everybody's excited. Bayern Munich are not what they was. You know, Kovac he won the league. He won the German Cup with Frankfurt last last year. 
And I wonder if there's certain managerial jobs that can be a little bit too big for certain young managers. And uh, I agree with Mike, there's no reason why Ajax can't get a positive result against Bayern Munich, especially in Amsterdam. Um, I give Ajax a very good chance of going through second, but I just think that the the, the key game will be uh, will be Benfica because they're not... This Benfica is an absolutely mammoth club, absolutely massive, you know, and um, they've, they've played Champions League football on a regular basis in recent years. Their home form is what's got them to uh, to the quarterfinals of the Champions League and uh, the last 16 of the Champions League. And they're going to have so much belief that their opponents in Athens and Ajax will be, uh, will be feasible for them. So I believe that if Ajax can get a positive result in Lisbon on the 7th of November, I can see them going through to the last 16. I hope that we're right on this and that we see some success for Dutch teams in Europe because it would be massive for the, for the country's league and coefficient. Uh, as a final point, um, PSV actually play Ajax uh, after this week's Champions League games. Um, are, these, are these European games to have a huge impact on, on the outcome of this? Uh, and, and who do you both fancy uh, as favourites for this match? Such a huge tie. Oh, it's, it's a massive tie. Um, at this early point of the season, I think you've got to look at PSV already being two points ahead of Ajax and, you know, being at home on Sunday, they're going to go into it with so much confidence that they can get a good result. And it's going to be interesting to see how Eric Ten Hag approaches it. I think um, I can see it kind of being cagey. I can see it being a draw. I'm going to sit on the fence on this one and say, say a, a scoring draw for me. I think it's going to be 1-1-2. One, one, I also think it's going to be a draw. And uh, if I can add as well, we were speaking about two Dutch teams in the Champions League. It's also, it's also great for us as a site and a pod to be able to have coverage of, of these games and give opinion of these games. Because it wasn't so long ago where we hardly could discuss uh, Dutch sides in Europe and we were, we were looking for ideas just to talk about different things to gain, to gain interest. And now we're, we're sitting here discussing um, PSV away at Barcelona and Ajax at home to Athens so it's uh, it's great for us and um, it'd be great as a well-timed boost for Dutch football as well and um, yeah I think the uh, going back to the point in hand I think that it's going to be a 1-1 one, one draw in Eindhoven next Sunday. Uh, interesting I think um, it's wrong to go for a draw and I think that one of these teams is going to win and it's going to be a huge win uh, but as to who that will be I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I'd be leaning towards PSV at this point purely because of home advantage, but too too tough to call. Um, and it could go a long way in deciding where the title goes this summer because both these teams are going to win so many games this season. The both of them look really like imperious, um, so which, which is good for the league to, to really push up the standards um, and also for them both to compete in Europe. All right, well, uh, Michael and James, thanks for joining me in this week's podcast. I um, hope the listeners enjoyed it. Thank you. you and um, this is a final point. I think we would all like to wish uh, Myron Boadu a, a speedy recovery from his horrible injury he suffered uh, against Feyenoord for AZ. Uh, it was horrible last season to lose Calvin Stengs to a similar injury when he was probably on the cusp of, you know, something special. And, uh, you know, a 17-year-old, he'd already scored two goals a season, two assists, and he looked something special as well. And uh, that's a horrible injury to get so early in his uh, career. Yeah, I, I, I second that. It's, it's never nice to see. And, um, you know, it's obviously part of football and, and these things can happen. And uh, you just hope he gets a, a speedy recovery and that, um, and that he'll, play, um, he'll play a part, even if it's towards the end of the season, perhaps, you know, to, to be involved again. But it's just about step by step, day by day, and fingers crossed for a speedy recovery. Yeah, agreed. It's a sickening injury. I, I feel very sorry for the man. Um... And so early in his career to suffer a second long-term injury, I just really hope that it doesn't hold him back in terms of pace and how he, how he attempts certain moves in his, in his attacking game because he is a, a wonderful prospect and one of the best for Dutch football at the moment. So, yeah, we all wish him the best.